che è un determinante degli anni di Cristo. Francesco di Lavi, il calcio della Lastre, è di una sospensione di tutti i calci storici. Apro una poem per la Sky on Tuesday. I got a wee bit of fright because I looked in his face. I noticed he didn't have any teeth. I realized it was a mask. So that's that's for that. That's so that's my new appointment. I've got this for three. Three. That's a lot of things to do. I don't need to wait till next week. You know, I've already had an appointment for that. But uh, as we, we gather here um, and, and look at this section of scripture, it is quite harrowing. So is it because it's the, the part where Jesus is led away and it, he comes up to the crucifixion and then he's, he's crucified, he's not died at this point yet. And it's quite an important uh, piece of scripture this, from the perspective that when we're looking at this this morning, it's not just about this, this bit up to the cross. Uh, and you know we might feel downhearted about that because when we look at the table set before us, the bread and the wine, we know that the outcome is there that has saved us from our sin. And I just want to uh, do a wee quote before we go and a wee uh, quick recap on a couple of things before we actually go and look at the post in the scripture this morning. And it's a great quote this, as for John Stewart. I used it a number of years ago uh, in, in a sermon in this church before and it came back to me. And it says this, this is what he said, before, before we begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Before we begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us because it was the sin that put Jesus on the cross that day. And I just want to do a wee quick recap before we, we do the, the reading this morning. Sometimes we, we miss a wee bit of the detail, you know, when we listen to the sermons on a Sunday morning or whenever we're doing our day of readings, sometimes we miss a word or sometimes we miss a couple of words that we, we, we thinking about something else and something that's getting said and so we, we kind of miss the points in you but and I just want to have a, a wee minute here looking at this because I think it's, it's really important about the recap of the trial of Jesus because it's going to play a wee part in what God is saying to us this morning and when you look at the trial of Jesus four times four times in that trial Jesus was handed over to somebody else. And it was based on the plea that it was their affair. Nothing to do with me, so to do with you, you know. So let's see what we can do. You remember, the high priest handed them over to Pilate. Pilate was the governor at that time in Judea. So he was the main man. So what happened was the priest came up, they say, this is your problem because you're in charge of the place. You need to deal with him. Somebody else's problem. And then Pilate says to himself, mm, I don't fancy dealing with this guy. There's a lot of people like him. You know, what am I going to do? Eh, I know, I'll give him Herod. Herod's there. He can have a look to see what he thinks should be done. So of course Herod did that. Then what happened was he said, oh wait a minute, this guy's nothing to do with me. You're the governor, I'm coming back to you. You're going to have to make a decision about what happens to him. And then what happened with um, Pilate at the end? He handed him over to the soldiers and went, this is nothing to do with me, I'm just going to over to the people to deal with this, which should happen to him. And that's the soldiers that will be crucified. You know, and then he's, no theatrical gesture, and that, no, uh, this is not to do with me, folks. You know, I think I'll keep my hands with you, Wash. This is not to do with me. I'm no end to do with business. You're the people that have made the decision about what should happen to him. I'm walking away from this. He said, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And what happened? This crowd rose back. 
Can you imagine it? The crowd roars back. We will take responsibility for his death. And see, when you think about this, just picture in your mind that scene, that situation, where all these people are in a boat, and you see it in places all over the world. You know, people are riding and you see them running down the street, breaking into buildings, pulling people away, all this kind of thing. You could sense the hysteria here. I was lying in my bed the other night and I was thinking about this, just thinking, what it would it be like to be there? And you see all this crowd. If you've ever been at a big concert or a big event, football match, whatever, and you see all the people all walking towards the place, they're all shouting and dancing and everything else because they're going to be a happy event, I would think. You know, but imagine all these people, and they're all shouting and waiting for somebody's blood and they're staring at the swept top of it. And you're trying to imagine what that is going to be like. The madness of the crowd on that day. Now remember all the things that Jesus had done for people, the miracles that he had performed, the people that he had healed, the feeding of the 5,000 and other things that he spoke about. And yet, a lot of these people had seen these things and heard about these things, but the madness that was driving them was that sin that was inside them. We want something done with this guy. And we want it done now. We will take responsibility for his death. You could really cut the atmosphere with a knife. Twice we see in these words it's your responsibility. Remember, it was used by Judas when Judas realised what he had done and handed over Jesus and betrayed Jesus and they gave him the 30 pieces of silver, took it back to the leaders in the church so they did the leaders of the synagogues and he gave it to them. And then by Pilate, in this instance. You know, this passing of the Lord Jesus Christ from one to another, you'll recognise it as a game that we often play the day, often play the day, if not every day. So it is. it's the supreme instance of that circular game that we play, of sidestep responsibility. Have you been sidestep responsibility? Do you know what it is to sidestep responsibility? How many times have you felt in your life that you needed to do something but you didn't fancy it? And you said, mm, don't buy it. Who else can I get to do this? I don't like the look of this. Or you start something and you go, I don't fancy <coughs> continuing this. Is there somebody else I can hand it over to? Or you've got that appointment and you make an appointment and then when it comes to the day of that appointment, maybe a hospital appointment or a doctor's appointment and you don't show. And so that appointment's vacant and somebody else who's really needing that appointment didn't get it because you've only brave enough to own up that you didn't want to do it until the last gasp. And that's what harms you people. We say step responsibility is painfully familiar. And what do we call it? We call it passing the buck. That's what we do. That's what I do. That's what we all do. Because there's all times when we feel that we need to do something. But we don't really want to do it. Or we try and catch it off and put it off for another time and we think we're maybe better suited to deal with that situation. Passing the buck. Does that sound familiar to you this morning? It's part of the daily picture of our lives. You see, the matter at hand needs to be found to belong to somebody else. Who can I give it to? I don't want to do it. Let's see who else I can pass it on to. You know, see, trying to <clears throat> locate responsibility in this day and age, it can be very difficult. And see, getting action, it becomes a life career. 
doing this because you're always looking for somebody else to do it rather than accept the responsibility and say, this is actually me, I should be doing this. And I'll give you a wee example. Janet and I went and bought a, an electric light and it was a gift for somebody the other week, yeah, a few, few weeks ago. And we, we gave it over to the person. And it didn't work. It was only part of working. You see what's going to happen now, you know? So we go and look at the paperwork. Make this big statement says, Whoa, well, we've got a top tech team. We can tell you anything, we can do anything. Phone this number. So, you phone the number. And somebody comes on, said, Yeah, got a problem. This is after you've been through press one for this, press two for that, press three. Remember what I told you a few weeks ago? After about 20 presses in the phone, you get to talk to somebody. And this is a tech team, supposedly. And the set is, did you plug it and plug it in again? <laughs> and, yeah. You're the technology expert, and you're asking if we've unplugged it and plugged it back in again to see if it works. Yeah, that's right, that's what we start off with. Okay, what's the second thing? We've done that. Have you done this? I've done that. What's the third thing? Now, we're protectively minded by the way, you know that. So it's all stupid things. So you get to the point. Four questions I've asked you. Have you unplugged it? Have you tried that? Have you tried doing that? Have you tried doing that? Yes, we're fine already. You know, this is how it goes. We can't help you. <laughs> uh -huh. You're the technology expert. Do you manage to eat carrot? <laughs> oh! I gave it a reasonable. I don't know, that's a side story. But, but do you know what I mean? Like? So you phone up somebody thinking they're going to come and do something for you, or going to tell you how to resolve an issue. But what the days of side state that? They pass the book. They don't want to do it. What do you suggest? Our suggestion is you take it back to the shop. <laughs> okay. okay. You take it back to the shop, right? To be fair, the person that's dealing with is pretty helpful. He says, Did you try this? You go, No, I don't know how to do that anyway, but somebody else does. He says, Well, can't you try that? So we went away. Try that. Does it work? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, we're well, right. Okay. So what happened is, we pass it off, take it back to the shop, and the guy gives us another one. We take it off the road, plug it in, press the box right away. But you see what I mean? People that you're expecting to be doing something, and that includes us, you, me, all of us. People are expecting something of you. God expects something of you. But what you do is you sidestep it. Or you try and pass the buck to somebody else. We have an appointment and God wants us to do it. But what we've done is we've cancelled his appointment because we don't want to. And what happens here is, this is where Jesus' appointment is. Because at this time, this appointed time, Jesus has been beat, he's been flogged, and he's just handed over to the soldiers. We really begin to see the brutality of not just a few soldiers, but of all the rest of them. And this is where we begin to look at the story here. So let's look and read the passage of scripture. Okay, is that going to be up the board? We're looking at Matthew 15 and it's verses 16 up to 32. 16 to 32. Yeah, good stuff. It says the soldiers took Jesus to the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, it's called the Praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe and, robe and they wore a woven thorn branch into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a reed stick. They spat him and they dropped to their knees in mock worship. 
And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. A passing by named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull of the north interpretations is Calvary. They offered him wine drunk with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes in two dice to decide to get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse at him shaking their heads in mockery. Ha! Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he <coughs> can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. Even the men who were crucifying with Jesus ridiculed him. That's one of these things, isn't it? They brought out the regiment and everybody wanted to get in on the act of torturing Jesus. Can you just imagine how that is? Torturing another human being. You see it all the time in the news these days. It's commonplace. You see the kids, there was a case on this telly the other day that a wee boy was 10 months old, his stepfather brutally murdered him. And you're saying to yourself, how can somebody stoop to that level of depravity and do that? But it harms. And society lets it harm because of the way you live. They don't want anything to do with God. They don't want to be with God. They want to be separated from Him. All these people wanted to get in the act of torturing Jesus, along with mocking Him. And then they put the robe and the crown of thorns on Him. Just remind ourselves that Isaiah, who was about 750 years prior to this, said his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. That tells you the level of the particular beatings that Jesus was given at that time. And it's no wonder that he was unable to carry his cross. But God always has a plan. And God had an appointment for a man. And what happens? Enter Simon of Cyrene. Now, when you go and you look at the map where Cyrene was, Cyrene is in North Africa, it's in Libya. Now, he would have been going to Jerusalem for the Passover. He stayed in Libya, and he's travelled probably on the region, I don't know, a thousand miles anyway to get to Jerusalem for the Passover. He's along the road who he does in the Romans with Jesus is coming toward him. And what happens? He's a passerby in the Roman road. Hey you. Where are you? What is it? I'm here for the Passover. You're not interested. Get that man's cross on your shoulder and start carrying it for him or else. The brutality to the regime. And obviously he's not going to say no. He's going to say, I don't want to really do it to yourself, but I better because something's going to happen to me if I don't. This claim is a passerby and made to carry the cross. See, the thing about the Romans is that they prepared and preferred to keep their victims alive until the crucifixion took place. Now the crucifixion 
Wasn't it a thing that was invented by Rome? Wasn't it a thing that was invented by the Roman soldiers? This had been invented back three, four hundred years beforehand by the Persians. <clears throat> Look, what did they know at that time? That when they invented that form of torture and form of death, they were fulfilling God's plan. Because this is what Jesus was going to be crucified on. There was an appointment in time and that was getting made for the first time. That was then going to be used to crucify the Son of God. But people don't recognise that. And they don't see it. But what had happened with the Romans was they had perfected ways of making it even worse than what the Persians did. You see, what happened with the Romans was they wanted to keep people alive so their victims didn't escape the full wrath of the punishment. And so what happened with Simon was that the Romans, rather than get a Jew, a local Jew, to carry the cross because what had happened is there would be uproar, uh, there would be a riot, because we don't want to do that. This is your problem. This isn't your problem. We don't want to do it. So what they do is they look for a wee innocent person walking along in gravel and pull him into the fray and he's the guy who carries the cross. They pass the buck to a stranger. It's interesting because in Mark's gospel it mentions his two sons, Alexander and Rufus. When you look at the account of this in the other three gospels, these two guys are only mentioned. But it's interesting that both of these people, Rufus and Alexander, they were missionaries. And they were over in Jerusalem at that time. And they became prominent people in the church, the early church in Rome. They became prominent in it. So this man would probably not just be coming for Passover, but he'd obviously be coming to see his son because obviously Mark's writing their names in. The people that knew Mark and knew what he was writing about would have known these people, and that's why he mentions them specifically by name. None of the other people mention that. So it's an important aspect about the appointment that God has for you in your life. As I say, they held the other position, eh, good positions in the other church. And then Jesus is brought to the state of the crucifixion. So he is, but he was offered wine mixed with Mark. Up there it says that he was, it was like drugged. You see, this, if you look at Mark, it's intended to induce sleep. And they used to use it in old days as a painkiller. Or they could use it as an anaesthetic if they gave you enough of it. But you see, but Jesus refused to take that. And the reason why he wanted to keep his mind clear, he wanted to keep his mind focused on what his father in heaven was wanting him to do at that point in time. And when we get something in our life that we've got to do to keep our mind clear at that point in time, Sometimes they pass the buck to another time when we days we fill our heads with other things so we take a bloss out. And that happens in our everyday lives because we're looking for an escape. But Jesus didn't have an escape. He didn't want an escape. He was living to take his father's will. And so therefore, he wanted to keep his mind clear and face the agony of the cross and of our redemption. You see, the suffering was necessary to the completion of our atonement, of our sin. Mark refers to the crucifixion very simply. He just said that they nailed him to a cross. You know, the Romans, as I said, perfected this form of torture and it produced a long, slow death with maximum pain and the maximum of suffering. And having removed Jesus' clothing before the crucifixion, the soldiers cast lots for itself, we would call it dice. But he cast these lots to see who was going to get what parts of the yamen. But all they were doing was fulfilling what the Testament again had said. Because in Psalm 22, in verse 18, it says this, They divided my garments among themselves and threw lots of dice for my clothing. Again, they were just instruments in God's plan. They were just instruments in fulfilling the ultimate appointment that Christ had in going to the cross for us. And they fulfilled that prophecy. <coughs> Remember, they put the sign above the cross, King of the Jews, 
Why? Because they couldn't find anything else to blame them for. They couldn't find another charge. But you see, I view that sign. I was lying in my bed the other night there thinking about this. Why is this sign, as it were? And I think this was a warning to the Jews, to the people of Israel, and that they would never have independence from Rome. They would never have independent rule because Rome would always put a blockage up in it. And that's what sometimes we get in this country, isn't it? SNP say we want independence, but we can't get it because the UK government says this, or somebody says that, or somebody says that. It's the way the Constitution is made up until the Constitution is altered. There will never be independence in Scotland until somebody down there or otherwise say this is what it's going to be and then what people do. That's the nature of what happens. Whether you agree with it or whether you disagree with it, the fact still remains that at that time Israel would not have independence from Roman rule. And any idea they had of that notion was nailed to the cross along with the Lord. That's when it was put. King of the Jews, and take that. At the crucifixion, remember Jesus was crucified in between two others who were being crucified at that time. We spoke about it before. One of them repented, one of them didn't. And you see the problem, or the thing is, for some people, Jesus is central to those who believe in him and those who reject him. He stands in the middle. This is the sheep of my pasture. These people are going to hell. He stands in the middle. There's no middle ground here. You've either that or that. And the people have to make a decision on where it is. God gives increase through Christ. But people have to look at their lives and say, I'm going to have an appointment one day. Would we'll say that I want to be in. That's why it's important for this church to preach the gospel and to preach the truth and to live a life as well as we can all we're calling. Because we've got family, we've got friends, we've got neighbours. They need to see something different in us. But you put the point to the side and just keep in the background and keep quiet and just say let somebody else do it. Do you think I were doing with guys yesterday and they were doing the open air? And it's interesting the people you talk to the open air. And the guy was doing the message the guy who knows some of the people in this church. He knows Rod, he knows Alexander, he knows Neil. And he rose Roger. I mean, that's interesting. So as usual we're talking to the folk around about the, the, the guy. And um, and he was asking, and we were we were just chatting away. But he was giving a message yesterday that people really didn't want to hear. He was telling people to get right with God. Just think about God. And think to yourself, is God real? Because if we don't, and we put it to that side, there's no future for you. Your appointment is death. And that's an important thing to recall. We need to preach the word in and out of season that people hear it. Moving on in the crucifixion, so we've been along the signs carrying the cross. And what happens is all these people are all following along. It's a spectacle, isn't it? People are wanting to see it. And I, I can't even over this that people want to go and see people being crucified and everything else. My old granny used to stay in the Gallagher. So she did. And they called it the Gallagher because he used to hang the people there. That's what it was. And then what they've done was, uh, if you know the uh, sort of Glasgow Cross area, 
told that in there. We used to hang the people there in a Glasgow green, that's where it was moved to, we used to call it, uh, I can't remember, it was some of Justin's Square prison. And that's where we used to do the hangings in Glasgow. Even in the, here, people used to go along and see these public hangings. I don't think I could go and see that to watch somebody else being killed like that. It's incredible. And all these people were all following the condemned because they wanted to see what was happening. Can you imagine that? These people shout abuse at the Lord, reveling in somebody being tortured. It's one of the most significant things for me in this passage about the suffering servant is this Jesus was not in any sense the victim of a group of circumstance. He was in complete control from the beginning to the end. Remember in John chapter 10 it told us this. The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. See, all these people that were involved thought that they had control over life and death. They thought they had the power to do anything that they liked. But they didn't. That was a claim to fame. And sometimes we look for a wee bit of claim to fame, don't we? You hear people talking about their 15 minutes of fame or whatever. And you think that they're in the public image, the public limelight or whatever, or they're amongst a group of friends. And see what they've done, what they've done. They're all looking to see what other people are thinking of. It was these people at that time's claim to fame. It just vanishes in the vapour. All they were doing was fulfilling what God had ordained because they were part of that master plan. The crowd shouted. And I want you to just read these verses again. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha! Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of the religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoff, but he can't save himself. Let this King of Israel come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. And even the men who were crucified with him ridiculed him. These people were looking for a miracle. And this is what exactly Jesus didn't do. He didn't give them a miracle because he'd done something better. He came down from the cross. He rose again on the third day. And that's why we believe in him. We come here and look at this communion table, the blood and the bread, the wine and the bread, the blood shed, the, the body broken. We come here because we know we are sinners saved by grace. He rose in the third day. And in closing, I just want to leave a wee couple of thoughts for you. You know, it's interesting. Jesus was crucified outside the city walls. You know, we say that in there's a green hill far away. Outside the city wall, the Lord the Lord was crucified and died to save his own. They've done that because they didn't want to contaminate dinner from the outer. So he's outside along with the rest of them being crucified. But it's quite interesting because pirates want people to know this spectacle was happening. And so when they put the sign up in Jesus, the King of the Jews, what they also done was they put the same sign up. But it was in Greek, so it was. And it was in Latin because of the Roman language at the time. He wanted the crucifixion to be as public as possible. Unknowingly to him that the message of Jesus and him crucified and reigning as king would be published in every language in all the nations at that time. He didn't know that. He didn't recognise it. He went, I want all these people to see this guy getting what these people want. Let's make a big spectacle of it. 
And then what happens? All these people hear about it. And the word of the Lord goes forth the start of the mission, as it were. Everybody would know Jesus because one day comes the judgment. When that judgment comes, as then, as will be, everybody's going to know the Lord. Where are you? Are you passing the buck? Are you ducking and diving? Are you bowling and weaving? Are you shimmying and shamming? What are you doing? I don't even want to do this. Is there somebody else I can pass this on to? There's about 600,000 people living in Lazio. There's about 40 in this wee church. What's he asking me to do? You have an appointment. Do you accept it? Or do you duck it? That's important. You might feel me a bit down hearted after that message. But we've got the table here before us. And we give thanks to the Lord that our sin has been forgiven and put upon him. And I just want to end with a quote. This is Charles Spurgeon. He was one of the best known Baptist preachers that there were. This man suffered from depression like nothing else. You think he had bipolar syndrome? But he did. And he said this, I find no better cure for that depression than to trust in the Lord with all my heart and seek to realize afresh the power of the peace-speaking blood of Jesus and his infinite love in dying upon the cross to put away all my transgressions. Do you feel depressed this morning because you're not really following the Lord as you should be following? Think about what that man said. And seek to realize afresh the power of the peace-speaking blood of Jesus and his infinite love and dying upon the cross to put away all my transgressions. You have a wonderful opportunity this morning. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Father, again, we just thank you, Lord, that we can come. Lord, and even look at the horror of those events and think, Lord, it was a sin of the world that put them there. But we thank you, Lord, that you did rise. You did build the temple. And you rose to bring life to us. You called us when you made us. Lord, we're appointed to face the judgment. Lord, we thank you that those that put their trust and faith in you. Lord, we thank you that that point will be met. Lord, we will be welcomed in to that place that you have made for us in heaven. And we thank you for that. And we just pray, Lord, as we move on with the service, Lord, and we close this part of the fourth communion. Lord, that you will help us to be uplifted and to give thanks. Because 